Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Q&A webinar about the impact of Brexit on UK trade since the end of the transition period, brought to you by the Institute of Export and International Trade and our partners for today, Bibi Financial Services. My name is William Barnes Graham, the Senior Content Editor at the Institute, and I will be your host for this afternoon. And thank you all for joining us today already. We have uh, over 100 of you, so a warm welcome to you all. We have two great speakers today tackling this topic. We'll hear first from Kevin Shakespeare, a regular on uh, the webinar programme, and the Director of the Academy at the Institute of Export and International Trade. We'll then be hearing from Alex Cooper from Bibi, who has two decades of experience with financial services, including providing lots of hands-on support for SMEs over the last few years, particularly around foreign exchange. But before handing over to uh, Kevin and Alex, I'd like to run a quick poll, uh, starting with this one. So this poll is, has your trade with the EU been affected this year so far? The options uh, range from, yes, it has in a negative way, yes, it has in a positive way, no, it hasn't yet, but we foresee difficulties. No, it hasn't yet, but we don't foresee this changing. So uh, no change foreseed. Um, and there's not sure as well. Um, while you're answering that poll, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Firstly, you can contact me with any comments or questions using the question panel on the control window to the right hand side of your screen. We hope to get to a number of your questions, uh, particularly towards the end of the webinar. So please bear in mind, we have received lots of questions in advance, so we'll not be able to get to all of your queries today. But if you do feel as though your question has not been answered, please do review our technical helpline or training and consultancy offerings, which we'll talk about later in the webinar. Secondly, you will receive access to today's slide pack and a recording of the webinar in a follow-up email we will be sending over the next few days. So please do try to listen in to today's webinar as much as you can. But just going to give you a couple more seconds to answer that poll. Give you a mini countdown. Three, two, one. And we'll just quickly share the results. So perhaps unsurprisingly, it has had an impact on a lot of businesses. 59% saying it has in a negative way. 8% in a positive way. And while around a fifth of you haven't seen any changes so far, uh, split down the middle uh, of uh, whether you anticipate changes coming or not, and 14% not sure. Thank you everyone very for answering that poll. I invite our first speaker, Kevin Shakespeare, uh, onto, uh, onto the stage. Kevin, any surprises on those results there? Uh, well, um, uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, everybody, uh, and um, thank you very much for completing the poll. Um, I guess, yes, there's, there's quite a high um, uh, number in, in terms of the impact in a negative way, and uh, what we're going to look through today is, 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 is some of the impact um, of those changes, what they mean for businesses, and um, uh, I, I guess what we try and do at the Institute is obviously look at ways of, uh, of trying to um, uh, understand the process uh, processes and mitigate uh, some of the impacts as well. But again, thank you everyone for completing the uh, poll. Indeed, thank you everyone. And uh, yeah, without any further ado, over to Kevin, over to you, Kevin. Right, thank you very much again. Uh, so um, what we're going to do in the next few slides before I pass to, uh, pass to Bibi uh, uh, and another poll just before that, is we're gonna quickly review some of the uh, changes for, for GBEU trade. Uh, both from the export side and the import side. And, and, and note, obviously, I use the word GB, Great Britain, because the circumstances with regard to Northern Ireland are slightly different. So uh, again, to quickly summarize, and I'm not, not going to talk for everything on this slide, is, 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 is that effectively, since the UK has left the single market and the customs union, there is this requirement for customs declarations, but also the requirement for safety and security declarations as well, which, uh, uh, which can be be provided by traders uh, working with hauliers and freight forwarders. There are requirements in terms of um, uh, uh, third country status, if we call it that, from, from Great Britain to the EU, that impacts the likes of uh, a wooden packaging, labelling requirements as well. Uh, and, and certain sectors like food business operators uh, uh, need to have an EU address. 
Um, and then as we're going to talk about in terms of impacts, there's specific requirements on rules of origin as well, that those goods must meet the origin, uh, UK origin requirements to enter duty free into the EU. So if we have the next slide, please, we'll quickly now look at the uh, some of the import requirements. So we've looked at it from a, a GB exporter, but what does it look like when you're importing into the EU? There is, uh, as well as an export declaration from, uh, from Great Britain, there needs to be an import customs declaration in the EU and an entry safety and security declaration. All the points we talked around certification requirements, licenses, documentation, also apply on the import side as well. And, and for certain um, uh, certain types of goods, uh, there needs to be import pre-notification. So for example, animal products, and that's for a system called Traces NT. So again, additional requirements for certain type of goods. And a key, uh, a key element, a key impact is, is requirement that import VAT becomes payable the point of entry into the EU unless steps can be taken to try and defer that import, import VAT. So that's been a key change as well in 2021. So if we, ha uh, if we have a next slide, please. We're now also going to look at some of the impacts of these new rules as they're referred to. Clearly, there, I guess when we think about negative consequences, there's the additional costs of making these customs declarations the export declaration from Great Britain, the import declaration into the EU. And there's the additional cost of licenses, documentation for compliance purposes as well. Um, th there is this requirement around origin. So if the goods are not of, of UK origin or cannot be claimed uh, 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 of UK origin, uh, then uh, import duty will apply on goods moving uh, in uh, from Great Britain into EU. And very happy to take questions on that. So in some cases, UK businesses have had to take the view that they've tried to uh, try and keep the end-to-end -end process similar to what it was before 2021 and sell on what we call DDP, delivered duty paid inco terms. That, however, does put more pressure and put more costs and liability on the GB, uh, uh, GB exporter. But in some cases, it helps to retain the sale. We also have starting from tomorrow, uh, from, from the 1st of July, the ending of the low value consignment relief in the EU, currently 22 euros. So effectively import VAT becomes payable on, on all goods moving into the EU. And we have the, uh, tomorrow the intro introduction of the import one stop shop, which is predominantly uh, uh, focused at e-commerce businesses as well. Uh, and and and, uh, and and the need uh, for effectively VAT to be uh, uh, payable at the point of sale. But happy again to take questions on that. And um, and we mustn't forget services businesses. It's not all about trading goods. Uh, certainly for trading services, there's been less com <clears throat> comment in the in the EU UK trade and cooperation agreement. But there are potential issues uh, uh, around business travel and new rules of doing business in EU countries as well, which can vary by EU country. Should we have the next slide, please? We're now going to look at some of the import requirements. And it's fair to say that a lot of the visibility has been on exports from GB to the EU. Uh, and some of the import requirements uh, are, are not fully in place at the moment. We have what we call a phased border operating model. So for imports of standard goods from the 1st of January, uh, there hasn't been a, re, um, uh, a compulsory requirement for what's uh, for full frontier declarations, which, uh, which has uh, basically meant a uh, 175 day rolling period to effectively make the supplementary declaration. But businesses, however, should be keeping records of everything they're importing because that supplementary import declaration is required. And so 175 days from the 1st of January was the 25th of June. So that period has now started. So if you've imported goods and not made an, an import declaration, then you will need to make that declaration for um, 175 days after the date of import. And that's for standard goods. <clears throat> Um, uh, obviously, for certain types of goods, excise goods, um, uh, animal products, um, uh, control goods, the declaration was required from the 1st of January. Uh, so we, we do speak to many companies who say, well, I'm not sure what my freight forward has done. Have they done it for me? Do I know they've done it for me? Well, you need to check because ultimately 
they should have been telling you that it's been done for you and you should get the files and, uh, and details of the declaration. Again, happy to take questions on that because it's a key area. Uh, and and in, in, in many respects, we haven't had the same import controls uh, and, uh, as we've had on the export side, but it's now starting to come into play. And in terms of the phase border off, Operating model, uh, an export health certificate will, will require to accompany the trade journey uh, for imports of, uh, of, of, of animal products from the 1st of October. So additional certification required. So from the 1st of January next year, full frontier declarations are required uh, unless you enter a customs special procedure that, uh, such as uh, CFSP, Customs Freight Simplified Procedures, that deferred a requirement to make a full uh, frontier declaration to make a, a initial simplified declaration. But then we're also starting to see the implementation of border control posts at the UK border. Um, if we have the next slide, please, which is my final slide. So, um, <clears throat> so we must think about it on the import side that we haven't seen all the impacts yet. We will see uh, from this 175 day rolling period I described the need for import um, uh, supplementary customs declarations, the requirement from the 1st of October for export health certificates, and then the um, uh, effectively border controls coming into play uh, at the UK border from the 1st of, uh, uh, of January next year. So it's important to emphasize that businesses need to get ready for these changes on the import side, just because something hasn't happened yet, something will happen, but also review closely your terms of trade. I referred to DDP, delivered duty paid. Look at what your terms of trade are, both on the export side, but also on the import side. So if your European supplier, for example, has been supplying you and, and sending the goods, um, they are, um, depending on the INCO terms, they may be liable for that supplementary declaration I referred to, and they may want to push back on that in future orders. So review your terms of trade. It becomes absolutely vital. So thank you for listening to me, and I'll pass back to Will for the next poll. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, obviously, there's so much we could say about the impact of Brexit on trade on and customs, but uh, we're going to try and focus this on, on polls and questions today. So um, we'll quickly get onto the second poll, which is to ask you, were you aware of the need for supplementary declarations for imports from the EU? And just while that poll is going, we've already had some really good questions come in for you, Kevin. Um, so one was, uh, it's actually about the, um, what's it called again? The one-stop shop. So Ingrid, as asked, could you say a little bit more about what the in, in import one-stop shop is? And Lucinda, uh, I believe this is a, a regular listener indeed, Lucinda, uh, has asked, if I only send goods to the EU occasionally, and that's B2B and B2C, and don't want to sign up for the one-stop shop, what are my options? So could you just say a little bit more about uh, IOSS? Yeah, so, so the concept of IRSS is 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 uh, is it's an import one-stop shop. So uh, if you're trading intra-EU and and you have establishments in the EU, you have the one-stop shop, the OSSS. But thinking about it from the import side, it's very much to account for import VAT, and it's there to try and simplify processes for businesses. Uh, so um, e e effectively, <clears throat> it's also linked to to the withdrawal. Uh, with a withdrawal of the low value consignment relief for, for goods under 22 euros of which import VAT becomes payable from tomorrow. So the concept of IRSS is, is that businesses, e-commerce providers who are trading up to a certain level need to register for the import, import one-stop shop. So the import VAT becomes payable at the, at, at the point of sale as opposed to the point of import. So in a lot of cases, e-commerce providers will have to sign up for the import one-stop shop. Um, uh, it's probably more likely to apply, I guess, for, for B2C, but I, I guess in theory it could apply for B2B as well, but it's predominantly based around B2C, business to consumer. Uh, and you would have to um, uh, uh, obtain an EU VAT number. Uh, that could be in uh, any EU member state. But bearing in mind a lot of EU member states to, to obtain an EU VAT number, you, 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 you need to make an application. 
but you also need to uh, to uh, put in some countries have a fiscal representative, an agent who acts on your behalf. So in that case, uh, there, there are costs in obviously obtaining an EU VAT registration, uh, and and there are also costs, uh, if applicable, for having a fiscal representative. So that's basically the principle, and, and it's not dissimilar from uh, e-commerce providers, uh, if you think about it, from the EU selling B2C to the UK. It's to try and, 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 and make sure to some extent the consumer receives the goods without any having to pay import that uh, and, 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 and depend on the INCO terms sometimes and not having to pay the actual costs of the customs declaration. So it's pushing back the VAT to the point of sale. Thank you. And to Lucinda's point, is that going to apply even to for one-off uh, exports? Um, so if it's if it's a sort of if it's a B to B transaction, then um, then it, it can be subject to separate arrangements. If it's a B to C business to consumer, that will apply. Yes. Great, thanks, Kevin. Um, hope that's been helpful, everyone. And just uh, do one more, Kevin, for one more question for Kevin at this stage. Uh, this is from Ed, who's asked: Will COVID or Brexit result in more onshoring of supply chains? Uh, I guess it's a good question. I, I remember when we were having our webinars um, last year that, 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 that the whole onshoring uh, elements of supply chain was, was coming into play and, and something we sort of said then is it's good practice in terms of, of, of supply chain management to, uh, to try and make sure that, um, uh, that, that you have resilience and alternatives in your supply chain. So I think COVID has had the impact of that. Uh, I, I, I guess with Brexit, it probably depends on on certain aspects. It is that certainly um, having having entity status and and, and having a, a local representation uh, could well happen, but I think it will depend on individual circumstances. Uh, and 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 the most important thing is to have resilience in your supply chain and have effective supply chains. Uh, clearly, with uh, clearly with Brexit, there could be some impacts in terms of the EU. Yes. It's a really interesting space and we did actually run a similar webinar to this in April on just this topic so uh, we can circle over recording to that later on but uh, I'll quickly close the poll and share the results and just under three quarters of you were aware um, I imagine we might have a few people who listened to our previous webinar on supplementary declarations so that might be why, but 14% uh, who haven't, we can send you a link to that webinar. And 12% of you aren't sure, again, we can send you the link. So thank you everyone for answering that poll. But without any further ado, I think it's time for the next part of the presentation. So it's my delight to hand over to Alex from Bibi. Uh, over to you, Alex. Thank you, Will, and um, thank you for joining us all this afternoon, and thank you for your time. Um, the next few slides running through Bibi Financial Services, the effect following Brexit to date uh, and a little bit of data for you and a welcome. Of so really a little bit about BB Financial Services, which BBFX uh, is part of that group, um, as you can see, uh, leading BBFS as a final uh, leading financial service provider since 82. But it's part of the BB Line Group, much, uh, much larger group, years old. Um, you can see by the numbers, there's some significant numbers over many sectors and obviously operating globally and funding in 120 countries, um, and like all this, the, uh, the ratings are there. Um, rated excellence so far, not a matter of ratings perhaps, but they're showing us as excellent, which is something we strive for constantly. Uh, next slide, people will. So a bit about uh, BB Foreign Exchange, BFX, gonna help me a little from now on. Um, <clears throat> let's go. So basically, yes, like there are many other FX providers in the UK, uh, BBFX is also, they can receive payments for foreign currencies globally. Uh, we are a dedicated business within BFS, BB Financial Services, um, but obviously we are also operating as a loan business. Um, so you don't have to have a BFS product in order to work with BB Foreign Exchange. Market leading uh, with same day settlement. Um, so key to turn your, your, your money quickly. Um, but it was initially, BFX was initially launched a few years ago uh, to BFS internal clients trading overseas. But uh, please, that we're now uh, offering uh, time a standalone FX product supporting UK SMEs, uh, which is where I come in. Thank you. Next slide, please, Will. 
So what I want to do is obviously just to really highlight a few, a uh, couple of to show the performance of specifically to the euro uh, since the referendum, and this will come as no surprise to all of you, I'm sure, about where we where we were, uh, where we got to, and um, what happened, and then where it took us to. So these are a day or so old, so do do forgive me if they're not 100 percent accurate, up to date to the moment. But as you can see, um, the 23rd of June 16, the EU referendum took place, and the UK voted to leave the EU. So as you see at the start of that graph, um, the, the euro significantly weakened um, and then grew as time went on uh, throughout 2015 um, up until sort of 2016 when uh, oh, it fell off a cliff, um, when the, the vote was unexpected, um, which is what markets are all about. The markets, the, the performance of the markets very much is about the expectation of what the, the traders and market analysts expect market to do and when something happens which is um, out of kilter, not expected and, um, uh, adjustments to the market, which you, you can see. And on the next slide, please, Will, the, uh, this is above a, a closer view, a vertical on the left-hand side, just above daily FX, it shows the 23rd um, of June, um, showing that we went off a cliff edge from sort of 132, just under 132, all the way down. As you can see, it dropped to 116. So, um, yeah, a significant, a significant adjustment due to the the, the unexpected result. And as you can see, it's, it's, it's been a significantly volatile currency ever since. In the early days, we, we got a little bit more stability as to moved on. And uh, to the right of the graph, obviously, it's it's up until about now. But even late last year, there was a lot of weakness to sterling. Um, partially driven by many reasons, and I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that COVID being significantly being one of those um, reasons for the sterling weakness, um, which, you know, euro still remain reasonably in sterling. Uh, next slide, please, Will. So really, as you can see, this is sort of following sort of the sterling euro performance since uh, Brexit was implemented. So that's kind of that's from we've done it from kind of November until now, just to show you, give you a picture of where the growth has been. So from a uh, has it, once again been no surprise to understand that um, Brexit, the effect on Brexit to the euro has been very much clouded by by COVID. Um, so it's been very difficult. Define um, the actual the specific reasons why the euro uh, has done what it's. Done. But from the point of view of, of sterling strength to euro, uh, those who are buying euro um, obviously enjoyed slightly better, um, slightly better rates. And you know, as of this chart, it was trading to about 117, uh, slightly lower than that currently. Um, but obviously, as you can see, it's peaked um, back in April, end of March into April. Um, touching sort of 170, the best part of 118. So we've seen some slight improvements. Um, yes, there's a, some positive news out of the UK being coming from a from a value point of view, um, with Europe being very slow to start to roll out its uh, vaccination. Uh, that's starting to pick up pace, the UK has as well, which has kind of helped us maintain its strength. But it's a, sterling is always a, a reasonably strong currency. Uh, not great the the sellers of Europe. Um, but there, as you can see, there are peaks and troughs there. Next slide, please. Just so this is really from the the ONS, um, sort of showing a, a two-year picture, is showing you what's happened um, really over the last couple of years. And these sort of exports of goods to the EU, EU increased in March 21. So we saw an uptick in in March 21, um, and it's sort of going through sort of machinery and transport experts to non-EU countries, 5.8 billion, March 21. But exports of chemicals increased by half a billion in March and 0.3 increased to non-EU countries. So there's some positive numbers there. Um, exports of livestock up 0.1 billion, exports of the rest of the world remain flat. So from the point of view of exports um, to the EU, it shows increases in March. Um, and moving on to the next slide, please, Will. And so, so a slightly different picture, as you can see here, the total exports fell in April. So we saw that sort of peaks in, in March, and they were sort of falling away in April, uh, which we certainly we've seen in, in trading. Um, from, the, from our trading point of view, we see it, we saw an adjustment. Um, but obviously, being a global business, um, we have other peaks and troughs elsewhere globally. Um, but there's a fall in exports driven by increase in exports uh, to non-EU countries, 
which is obviously where the other from BBFX point of view do benefit also. Um, partly offset by a small increase in X to the E. So that's from April 2019 to 21. It's giving you sort of a broad picture over a couple of years. Next slide, please, Will. So all I've done is really sort of summarise um, just a few points, really, kind of December 2020, trading at 1.09 on the euro, and it's now sort of circa 117 as of yesterday, and it's dropped back a little today. Um, but obviously a, a significant shift, and those who are who are obviously buying euro will have enjoyed um, healthy a help to them over that period. Um, spot trading um, is growing strongly from from our point of view, it's about 15% year on year. Those who are who are spot trading and that they are starting to grow more and more. Um, we are seeing a, a health, a very healthy increase year on year there. Um, from a BBX to put it into to, to perspective, I suppose BBFX uh, maintained its business in last year, so there was no reduction in our in our turnover and income last year, which um, kind of bugged the trend of the market. But that's because of how BBX operates and uh, within BB Financial Services. Um, but what we have seen a significant um, uptick has been the amount of contract trading. Uh, well over 30% um, increase in, in 2021. Um, all at the end to ask you about that, but I think it's very much, it's, it's a strong indicator that our clients are looking to shore up rates when they're quite, um, whether they're selling forward, whether they're buying forward. So they are limiting their fluctuation, their risk, um, and the effect of their own bottom line. It's a significant increase on the forward contracting with our clients. Um, so yes, yeah, so I see the greater um, client emphasis on securing, securing securing rates to protect margins due to market market volatility. So people are being a little bit more careful, um, are being fo very focused on the market. And with BBFX, um, you know, we are able to offer very significant levels of forward, whether it's with a deposit or also a zero percent deposit. Also, one last time to mention that obviously. The COVID vaccine rollout continues to have a significant impact on GDP strength. And when uh, there are other more positive um, notes from elsewhere in Europe, it knocks the euro, it knocks the sterling back a little bit. But as a rule, we're seen as a strong currency through our, our trading. Um, and COVID vaccination rollout has certainly uh, had a, a very positive effect on sterling to date so far. And I think that's my last slide, Will. So I've actually flick it on if that's a. Uh, your time. Um, the pleasure to you through a few bits and pieces about BB Foreign Exchange, and uh, I welcome any questions. Thanks, Alex. Uh, really interesting as ever. It's, we would be uh, maybe do a, a weekly update on finance uh, FX in our uh, daily update, which goes out to our members. And it's always really interesting seeing uh, the sorts of things which impact currency um, rates. We often see things like uh, the interest rate decisions and yeah. Or actually, not even that. It's the speculation around the, the mm -hmm. decisions and the market, the, the meetings of the central banks seem to have as much impact as as anything else. Sometimes it's really interesting to see what what sways the market. Um, obviously, COVID and Brexit tend to have a significant impact. On yeah, absolutely, Andrew. yes. <laughs> yeah, one one wrong word from a politician or a, a someone giving a hint can move markets significantly, and has had a great deal recently. It's really interesting. Yeah, I do recommend uh, keeping an eye out for those updates if um, if you are reading our daily update. But uh, just going to, as we go into the the, the meta Q and A from now on, I would just a quick uh, third poll, just asking you if you use spot or forward contracts for uh, FX trading, or if you use a mixture of both. Um, and there's an option there if this is a currency is not currently a, a, an issue for you, or if you're not sure what, which one you are using, or which one you would use. Just while people are answering that poll, uh, a question, um, Alex, from Hazel, who's asked, have you seen any shifts in trading volumes to specific currencies like the dollar instead of the euro? Yes, um, I have seen a significant uh, increase. Um, and actually, once again, in the forward contract buying, there's been quite a shift. Um, I'd say probably a good 10 to 15% increase uh, year on year. That part partly masked by obviously a fairly flat year last year, but obviously we've seen that regaining um, of uh, of momentum of trading this year. So absolutely, yeah. Really interesting. And a question from Matty is actually about kind of a uh, Bibby's 
because of FX support. So he's asked, how quickly do you settle FX trades and what do you charge? Um, we're same day settlement. So depending on when the funds come to us, um, it'll be same day. Um, so we like to turn funds around very quickly. Um, we do not charge the no settlement fees at all, whether it's being back to a UK bank account or wherever it goes in the world. Um, we aim to settle the same day for wherever we send without charge. Great. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I'll quickly share the results to that poll. Um, so, so a fair few of you aren't sure, so not maybe not as many people doing FX trades at the moment as, a, uh, as, as maybe on our previous webinars, but hopefully that session has been useful for all of you there. Um, about 22% uh, of you are using one or the other, so uh, slightly more using both and 7% spot, 6% forwards. Um, but uh, yeah, interesting. And thank you everyone for answering that poll. And yeah, as noted earlier, this is the rest of this webinar is largely Q&A format now. So um, to bring uh, Kevin back into the fold, uh, Kevin, we had a question in from Rebecca, who's uh, who said, I've heard that inward processing is a solution for various Brexit related uh, difficulties. Uh, could you say a little bit more about what this means? Uh, yeah, again, thank you very much for the question. Um, inward processing is is an interesting one, and I guess uh, uh, trading 2021 20, post transition period has opened up opportunities. So, if I give an example, the concept of inward processing is where you're importing goods from from overseas, and you're and you're um, and potentially re-exporting. So, upon import, if you're approved for inward processing, which is a custom special procedure that you have to be approved for. Uh, which in itself isn't easy to obtain, um, uh, then uh, you, you, the duty, the import duty and the import VAT is suspended and uh, is not paid until uh, uh, till, um, till the goods are, are, um, are released into the home market, Great Britain. If, however, as you subsequently re-export, uh, re the, uh, the uh, import duty and import VAT is eliminated, so you do not pay. So an example would be bringing goods in from China, from Thailand, Taiwan, for example, or even the United States. If it's inward processing, it's likely that the goods are raw materials, component parts that you're turning into finished goods. So you're bringing in, uh, as, as, as part of a, a production, a, a manufacturing process, goods into Great Britain, uh, you're then processing them into a final part and re-exporting. So it's that component part, raw material part, which the duty is is effectively suspended and then eliminated if you're if if you're if you're re-exporting as well as the VAT. So it can be extremely useful. And the fact is that uh, goods moving to the EU are now exports, and they weren't previously exports. Brings into play that opportunity. Uh, so it, it could be quite useful for businesses there, and, and if you're processing a substantial transformation, you you could then meet the rules of origin if it becomes a UK origin, uh, so the goods are entering the EU duty free. So for some types of businesses that produce as manufacturers, inward processing could be extremely useful. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And uh, again, it's something we've done a. Uh, uh... A, web, a webinar one before, so it'll be something we can send links to if, if that's of interest. Uh, just a quick tip on questions, everyone, by the way. If you could keep the questions relatively succinct, it makes it a lot easier for me to read them. So um, please do try to keep them to one sentence if possible. Uh, question in from Daisy. Uh, I think this will be for Kevin. Uh, Daisy's asked, are fast parcel operators using delayed declarations for door-to-door -door services? It's a good question. I think it's, it's obviously down to uh, to each fast parcel operator. In a lot of cases, so I, I guess if, we, if we're thinking about it clearly from, from GB to EU, the, the declarations are, are required anyway. So we're very much thinking about this question in, in the context of goods moving from uh, the EU to Great Britain. So um, certainly we're aware of a number of fast parcel operators that are not necessarily using delayed declarations because uh, their operating model is based on that end-to-end -end service anyway. So it, it's probably for, for, for the SP FPOs less likely to apply. But a key challenge becomes that if you're, if you're an importer using the services of a fast parcel operator, you need to check with them as to whether a, a, a declaration has been made or whether they intend making a supplementary uh, 
declaration. You should be receiving information that a declaration has been made um, and, and, it, and, and probably a, a fee charged if the, if the, if the fast parcel operator is making it on your behalf. So if, if, um, if you're a consumer, probably it's, um, it's different. But if you're a business receiving goods, a lot will depend on the INCO terms agreed. So if it's if it's again DDP deliver duty paid that the EU supplier is selling on, they are responsible for the declaration uh, and uh, um, uh, and import VAT and any import duty if, if the rules of origin are not met. If, however, it's DAP delivered at place or some other INCO terms, it's your responsibility. So it should be clear what INCO terms are being used. And again, happy to take questions on that. If you're not sure, you need to check. But you, um, if, if, unless it's DDP, it's your responsibility and you need to check with the fast parcel operator what they've done. But again, thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you, Davey. That's a really good question. And um, we've been getting quite a lot of questions on uh, fast parcel operators and all of these webinars. So it's always good to cover that one. Uh, a question for Alex is one from Fran, who's asked, are your exchange rates typically better than those of banks? Thanks for the question, Fran, and one I, I get asked uh, very often. Um, and yes, the answer to the question is, is significantly better. We offer market-leading rates. Um, banks, as a rule, will charge anywhere between 3 and 8% um, within the margin, plus uh, the remittance fees. Volume, depending on the currency to the day and the time, uh, and the trading pattern, um, you'll expect a significantly less than a 3% uh, margin uh, cost to you. So there are significant savings to be had uh, on all trading of all sizes, um, from the smallest client to the very largest. Uh, but very commonly, um, will auto trade, if you're receiving currency and auto trading, so you're getting sterling to put in your account when you've received what you think is the receiving payment in the euro, uh, the auto trade without checking the rate, um, and you'll be, be, probably be charged the higher end of the 3%, 3 to 8%. But uh, yes, BBFX will significantly reduce your FX cost. Thanks, Juan. Um, we've had another question for Alex. This one is in from Coco. It's all about financial services, actually. So this is tapping into a different, I suppose, a bit further back in your career, but possibly about this. I'm sure you're keeping well abreast of all of this. Um, so she's asked, what is the situation with financial services? My understanding is that it's not being covered very well by the trade deal and that no agreement has so far been reached. What implications could this have? Yeah, I mean, the reality is well, a trade deal has not been done. Um, from a financial services point of view, London is a is a significant player in global financial services. So yes, the, the, the scaremongers out there, I think we're talking about very much uh, Believe the EU financial services business will close down or move abroad. Some have moved their offices, um, but I think London being has such a significant financial services centre globally, um, it's only a matter of time for a deal is done and supporting is allowed, enabling um, us to offer cross-border far far easier, not just payments but financial services throughout Europe. Thank you. Yeah, so, so, I, mean, I know this is something, Kevin, you, you probably follow us as well. Is there any, any thoughts as well? Yeah, I think it's interesting in, in that the, the wider aspects of trading services were not necessarily referred to much in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the agreed EU-UK uh, trade and cooperation agreement. There's been obviously lots of talking around the concept of passporting uh, uh, and equivalents, and clearly financial services is, is a key area uh, for both the EU and the UK, so um, uh, if, if there is if there is an equivalence deal, then then I guess that is better. But any any financial services firms have to consider what the um, uh, uh, what equivalence is in relation to passporting, especially around the notice period. And there was a, a dispute last year between the EU and Switzerland, which probably negated, if you like, uh, 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 some of the benefits of equivalence and, uh, and, and it created difficulties for Swiss financial firms. So it's something that businesses need need to be aware of if you are trading in financial services that the, the best we can get probably is equivalence uh, but but even even equivalence in itself is, is not a, not the same as passporting which was available prior to the uh, end of the transition period 
Thanks, Gavin. Thanks, Alex. Really interesting area. And again, one we'll try to keep abreast of over the next uh, coming months. I just had a notification on my phone saying the EU has agreed to delay Brexit chilled meats checks in Northern Ireland for three months, which uh, has been talked about for a few days. And so it's been in the latest negotiation um, hot topic, let's say. Um, in terms of the Northern Ireland protocol, I've had a couple of people ask about it. Uh, Kevin, what impact has it had on, on trade between Britain and Northern Ireland? Yeah, again, it's a, a, a again, it's it's a good question, and um, certainly there have been a a number of uh, of impacts. Um, probably the, the the main and visible impact is the requirement on in, uh, import declarations being required and entry safety and security declarations for goods entering Northern Ireland from Great Britain. So, um, uh, and and there is the Trader Support Service that's been stood up to to support uh, that requirement for those declarations. So that's the big impact there. Um, th th there are other impacts, however, to note, and and it is you mentioned about chilled meats, which has obviously received some visibility. There are currently easements in place, which 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 do mean that some elements of certification. Uh, and uh, which uh, also the requirement in chilled meats, even fast parcel operators. There are easements in place, and also if you're if you're providing um, uh, uh, selling to uh, 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 animal products to large supermarket chains, uh, there are easements uh, around the requirement for export health certificates. Uh, so all all those easements are due to end on the first of October. So businesses, and yes, they could be subject to uh, further negotiation. Businesses need to be aware of those impacts. Uh, and um, again, if you're if it's a fast parcel operator or, or uh, requirement for export health certificates uh, not being needed for selling to supermarket chains, uh, those easements are due to end. So they will be required. So it, it, it is very important to, to, to add those facts uh, uh, to, to the point that uh, import declarations are required for moving goods from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, as well as entry safety and security declarations. With regard to NI to GB, it's generally unfettered access uh, un unless you're moving controlled goods. Um, so that, that yeah, for example, dangerous chemicals, uh, 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 rough diamonds, um, and and goods such as that. Um, so there will be some circumstances in which uh, declarations are required for uh, for controlled goods, albeit that will be the exception. And and also uh, any any trade in in endangered species, CITES goods, will require export declarations for moving to Northern Ireland to Great Britain. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Really comprehensive answer. I mean, I mean to you, Alex, it's, we thought it was over the negotiations when the trade deal got uh, signed on the dotted line, but this is going to continue for a long while yet. Presumably, markets anticipating various more hiccups in the post-Brexit negotiations, and this could continue to have an impact, presumably. Yeah, that's, that, yeah well, there's no real end. Um, things will be finalised, trade agreements throughout. So uh, yes, I think once again it's been clouded. All of this has been clouded so much by COVID. It's kind of very difficult to see what the actual effect um, of lack of trade agreements and lack of and NI has had. <clears throat> um, so the reality is sterling remains strong um, from the outlook of the markets. Uh, pre previously, the predictions were that uh, euro is going to get the 17, 117, 118. Dollar was going to hit uh, the 140s. That certainly dropped back. So um, we're tinkering around sort of the 116 fives on the euro and 138 currently. So sterling remains reasonably strong, but there has been significant pushback from from the dollar. Region. So uh, until a significant number of trade agreements are done um, and issues are, are more are more resolved, and I don't think they'll ever be resolved. Um, we are going to see some considerable amounts of instability in the market, which has probably driven the the forward contracting, um, the clients buying it forward, um, securing that rate now for a point in the future so they can budget better. Um, but yeah, do remain for some time as yet, um, but forever in a day, but uh, we're not seeing a trend currently. Really interesting. So I think that it's just really all about kind of mitigating the, the risks in the market because there's, there's plenty of these in this sort of um, yeah. un unfettered times. But um, we'll do one, we are starting to run over. So we'll do one last poll and one last question. Um, so I'll get the poll up quickly. This is a simple one. 
uh, how confident do you feel trading with EU uh, six months following the end of transition? And the options range from very confident to not at all confident. And just one last question for Kevin. It's something we've not touched on yet, but it's around business travel. So Ross has asked for a B2B uh, customer commercial visits in EU, say France, Netherlands and Germany in one trip uh, are common. Will there, be a, will there be any restrictions or will there be a need for visas? Yeah, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a really good question. It actually links in and we have a, a large services webinar next week and, and, and this will be one of the important areas. There are, there are changes uh, around business travel and, and I think it, it does depend on the nature of the business travel. So whilst it's easy to say the general principle is that you can, you can stay for 90 days in, in any 180 day period without a visa, I guess it does depend on the nature of the business that you're undertaking. So, in, in <clears throat> excuse me, in some cases, if you're if you're if you're going to the EU to carry out repairs, uh, or or, or uh, uh, to, to a business, or or to provide consultancy for a business, there are limitations there in 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 actually your your, your ability to uh, uh, to actually travel and carry out that. Less so if you're providing it on behalf of a consumer. So uh, in, in next week's services webinar, that's going to be a key topic we're bringing out. So if you are, if you are carrying out a B2B transaction uh, and you are traveling to the EU to, to, to effectively carry out that transaction and get paid for it, there are some limitations which we'll discuss in, in next week's services webinar. If you're going overseas, for example, to, to, to attend a conference, that is slightly different and uh, uh, generally that that will not require a, a visa. So it depends on the nature of what you're going to be doing in the EU. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. A really good question. And we will um, share. Um, we we're sharing a lot of things, but we'll definitely share the link to, to that webinar because that is uh, the next one and a really important one. So keep your eyes peeled for, for that. But I'm just going to close that last poll and share the results. Um, this is really interesting. So well over half of you are confident, 58% quite confident, 15% very confident in your trade of the EU post-Brexit and around a quarter of you uh, less confident. Um, but I always caveat our polls and that's we, our, our regular attendee, attendees on these webinars have been on other webinars before, so therefore taken very um, big steps towards preparing for the changes. Um, so essentially you're very excellent people and businesses but um yeah thank you for answering that poll anyway it's, it's really interesting to see that and i will now start wrapping up this webinar so thank you once again to uh kevin and alex for the presentation and answers i hope everyone has found that useful um before we go just a, a reminder um or some of the support that the IOE is providing to help businesses adjust to the new normal in the world of supply chains and international trade, whether that be following the impact of Brexit or COVID-19. Membership with the Institute gives you a range of supports, including discounts on training courses, access to our experts, experts via our technical helpline, member-only webinars, consulting support, and lots, lots more. And we also offer a fantastic range of qualifications uh, for people who are looking to really embark on a career in international trade or put their staff through, um, uh, well, get their staff to know more about it. Uh, so for more information, please do visit export.org.uk. And uh, for now, Thank you everyone for tuning in. We hope you found that useful and we look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thanks everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.